Oh man, look, it's the prophecy brother. We've got nothing like this in my country. Nothing, I tell you. Starring Brother Man. And brother champion. They are brothers. They are unorthodox. Tonight's guest, Daniel Goodwin. Good evening, welcome to the Prophecy Brothers. All right, hey, if you watched our show last time about are the Nephilim real, this is part two. And uh, we've got uh, the other side of the coin. We've got uh, somebody that uh, says uh, the Nephilim, that's, uh, that's sci-fi. And uh, he's a giant in his field. And welcome to the Prophecy Brothers again. It's been a long time. Evangelist Dan Goodwin. Welcome. Well, brothers, it's good to be with you again. Uh, it has been a while. I, I looked on back and found some shows we did a couple of years back. And, uh, of course, I'm on, I'm on Facebook with you. And uh, you and I talk every now and then on Facebook. And I uh, appreciate you guys so much. I hope you get this Rumble channel going because uh, all the censorship on YouTube, we're all having that same problem. It's crazy. Amen. Yeah, you bring up Thank a good point. Much. I do want to bring up a housekeeping for anybody that's watching. Um, go to our Rumble channel. Uh, we're, we want to build that subscribership there. We're back on YouTube again. Uh, we lost a lot of our subscribers and viewers, and we're building that back up slowly. But uh, there's been just things, you know, the, the mainstream uh, tech companies, they're blocking everything, and we've had videos taken down since. The channel hasn't been shut down. So go to the Rumble channel, check that out. Um, Help us spread the word on that. So thanks for bringing that up, Brother Dan. Uh, well, you, this all started because you're right. We're connected on Facebook, and then I saw that uh, you said, "Hey, I've got this book coming out, The Great End Times Distraction," and about the Nephilim. And uh, so we we chat a little bit, and I said, "Hey, could you come on the show and talk about?" It? You said, "Sure." But before that, I wanted to. Uh, I, I thought we'd have part one of the show uh, because we're going to be talking about. Uh, you know what the bible says and to be honest with you uh i i'm on your side with this and i told david that before you know the, the david paxton if you watch the first one i i said hey are you you're kind of pro nephilim why don't you come on and explain that and you know just i let him know that hey i'm on the other side of it he had no problem with that and so i, I thought that would be a good lead up because you're going to be refuting that and so part one shows what uh what, what they actually believe and in, in about the Nephilim and where they came from. And so uh, that's my intro for this. So what, what prompted you, I guess, Brother Dan, to write this book? All right. Well, before I get into that, let me just say something to Brother Paxton. I do not know Brother Paxton. Uh, I guess I don't know that he knew who I was. I think maybe he didn't. But uh, um, I, I've got no axe to grind with him or Brother Mr. Heiser or uh, L.A. Mazzulli or any of them, um, but I have believed basically what I believe all as long as I've been a Christian. Now, I didn't understand it like I do now. In fact, I didn't understand it a year ago like I understand it now. I, I, my belief hasn't changed, but I, my belief has gotten stronger, and I've got so much nails that I can pound in that coffin to end the whole discussion, um, things that I didn't have a year ago. There were two basic things that I've always had, and I've always asked people, that were on the other side of the issue. And when I bring up those two things, they would change the subject, no, no joke, they would change the subject and, and talk about something else. And I always wondered about that. There was just two, two simple things that I would say, I'd say, look, I'm kind of on the fence. I could, I could be persuaded. Uh, I said, I lean against it, but I could be persuaded, but, but answer these two things for me. And when I bring up those two things, they, good men now, I'm talking about guys that I know that, that believe in the Nephilim, uh, maybe they don't believe all this stuff that's out today, but they, they believe the Genesis 6 thing. And I would ask by two simple things, and they would change the subject and, and, 
we wouldn't talk about it anymore. I, I mean, that's happened three or four times with men that I know. Um, it's it's kind of strange. So I wanted Brother uh, Paxton to know I did watch the entire program. I don't know if he'll watch my program with you. I hope he does. And but I did watch his entire program. I took two pages of notes. I eat, drink, and sleep this stuff. Um, I I was six months writing this little two hundred page book. Six months. I mean, just I think God had the the timing worked out. I think God wanted it to come out at a certain time, and I was trying to get it out soon. I had pre orders six months ago. No kidding. People had pre ordered the book six months ago. They probably forgot the, forgot about the book by now. And uh, it just, I mean, you, that's not supposed to happen, you know, 30 days maybe, but six months. I mean, it just, uh, it just took that long for me to set it up the way that I finally decided to set it up. The book is in three parts, by the way. Part one deals with, um, part one deals with the Nephilim, what I call the Nephilim distraction. And part one, it's, it's like 20 pages. It's, it's just a brief part. I give what the Nephilim crowd believes. I give Chuck Missler's view, which is shocking, by the way. Absolutely shocking. If you want me to read that later, I'll read it. Because I think the viewers need to hear what the man said. Now, he's gone now. He's in heaven. And I've got no, no ill will towards him or any, anybody on the other side. But what he said was absolute sci-fi, fairy tale. And uh, back in 1997, I wonder how many preachers got their foundation from reading after some of that stuff, that wild stuff. I mean, he talks about UFOs uh, abducting women and uh, torturing them with metal objects, whatever that means, and uh, impregnating them, dropping them back off to their house, coming back later to get the fetus. Now, you ever, that's sci-fi. There's, there's nothing in the Bible about that. And I don't believe there's any valid proof of that happening. But, uh, you know, and, and I don't argue with the with the UFO guys. I, you know, they're they're in another they're on another planet than I am, and uh, I think you can believe something so strongly, you just you got blinders. You'll never see the truth, and and you can't you can't waste your time with that crowd. Yeah, and well, I mean, I want to bring something up. Um, yeah, David is a we consider him a good friend uh, here of the show, and and uh, we've actually met him personally, and and so. Um, we can have different opinions on this and still uh, be yeah. brothers in Christ. In fact, uh, we're brothers. But yeah, my my You're biological the brother here, brother. The, the the guy that I identify as my biological oh, yeah. brother uh, and co-host, oh, yeah. uh, we have different views on it. So uh, you know, which one of you guys is older? Is that confidential information? What, oh. What's that? Which, which one of you guys older? is older? Oh, I am. That's why I look older. But which one is is? But you told me before he got in that you were the smarter of the two. Is that true? Uh, he's yeah, smarter. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. He, he's in charge of everything. You're, what is your official uh, title? Are you a mechanical engineer? We don't want to talk about that. Okay, uh, he's smart. <laughs> he's smart. He's smart. He. Uh, I, I will tell this uh, for, for everybody. I don't mean to get off topic here, but uh, my middle son went to work with him. And uh, he goes in this company and he goes, practically every machine in this company was designed by brother champion well it may sound like something but uh you know god set up so i have a job and uh i can i can pay for stuff so you know god provides so he's smart. Have a job i have a feeling you'll never want for a job if you can do that kind of stuff well god's a good troll so, so but, but we disagree and you of course brothers family disagree all the time and, so. and uh we've gone through a lot of the chuck messler uh uh like to learn the bible 24 hours and uh but yeah, as far as the UFO stuff, uh, I don't remember exactly what you always said, but yeah, in his book, it's in his book about uh, aliens, 1997. I've got it. I have it in here. Okay. Uh, it's pretty shocking, but but it's not just him. Steve Quayle, Ellie, uh, uh, Tom, uh, Tom Horn, the Tom stuff Horn, that they've right. got. No, I've got a lot of their books, and I, I read through them. Uh, but I believe uh, you know the Bible says. Uh, I mean, well, a couple of things I want to point out there, and but you know, we want to listen to what, what you have to say. You you're bringing sound doctrine, which is you know, what we want. But like in the, I think it was the Book of Proverbs, uh, it says in a multitude of counselors there's safety. So yeah, you know, we want we want to you know receive what God has, uh, you know, from the you know counselors, you know, and uh, we're to work out our own salvation with uh, with uh, fear and trembling, like it says in Philippians two twelve. So. I believe you're bringing us to a point where 
you're, you're saying uh, you'll look with, there's some distractions going on, some uh, you know, deception. You know, we, we got to you know, have fear of the Lord, you know, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So we're not you know, going too far <laughs> in the wrong direction. So, Like I said, the first part of the book, I, I reveal what, not what I say they believe. I believe in, I, I reveal in their own words what they believe. And I think that's an important distinction here. And I also write a couple paragraphs or a couple pages about the whole scenario from the gap theory, the Luciferian flood, all the way to Genesis 6, and then all the way to right now with the UFO stuff. I give the whole picture. Now, not everybody believes all of that, but everybody believes pieces of it. But I give the whole scenario, and that's all in part one, in the first 20, 24 pages. Part two... I talk about the Nephilim discernment. In that chapter, I try to educate people about how to get truth, how to find out the truth, how to learn and discern what is right and what is not right. I, I, I have my seven laws of Bible study. It's a book I wrote a long time ago. It's a little Bible study help. Seven laws that will help you study out anything you want to learn in the Bible. Those seven laws will be a good guy. The law of context, the law of first mention, that kind of stuff. Comparing scripture with scripture. Uh, last on the list is common sense, believe it or not. The law of common sense. If, if, if it don't make sense, better go study it again. And so that's part two. The biggest part of the book is part three, and I call that the Nephilim debunked. And I believe that I do just that. And I believe anybody who's a, a Bible believer and is willing to let the Bible be the authority, I believe I will convince them, as I've done several people just in recent days, I have a preacher friend. He's been on the other side of this all of his life. And uh, we used to joke about it. We wrote a book together in 2008. And we joked about it. I'd say, Brother Walt, huh? well, I won't use his name, but uh, a, a preacher, I, I just saw him behind that tree. And he'll laugh and I'll laugh. And, and he, he's been on the other side of this. I told him, I said, I'll, I'll call him Brother Bill because his first name's Bill. Brother Bill, when my book's done, I'm going to send it to you. You're going to be my first convert. Well, I sent him an ebook because he, he missed the book. He went to Mexico on vacation. I sent him an ebook. He sends me a text. He says, I read the book. I'm now on your side. I believe what you believe now because I'm a Bible believer first. And he said, I never really studied this out for myself. And he said, I can't refute what you're saying. What you're saying is the truth. Now, that was big. That was huge for a guy. Now, we were friends, but that doesn't mean he's going to change his mind just because we're friends. Because he's believed this all of his life. And uh, so I, I feel like that was a good testimony about what I did in this book and how I laid it out. And, uh, and you know, but the reader's got to decide. Uh, after you read it, you, you, the reader's got to decide, is, is that true or not? Because uh, you can't believe something just because I say it or, or Chuck Missler said it or Steve Quayle said it. You got to get it from God and his word. And so that's how the book is laid out. And there's a lot of chapters in there. And any one of those chapters is a nail in the coffin of what I believe, a nail in the coffin of what I call the Nephilim, the great Nephilim end time distraction. Because that's what I believe it is. Right. Can you pull up Genesis 6? And let's read that where Genesis that, 6, that, that first, that verse. Because I was trying to find verse it here. One in the through book. Four. And I know you have it in the book here, but it'll be easier. He's got his Bible out. Because let, let's let's disseminate that. All right. Genesis uh, 6, uh, okay, 1 through 4. But it came to pass when men when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and, the da and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of, of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. Oh, stop those, right there. Stop. Okay. Think about that for a second. Think about what you just read. That's important. Think about what you just read in that one line. Now go ahead and start again and read verse four. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in, and unto the daughters of men, and they bear children, uh, uh, bear children to them, 
the same be became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Okay, did you catch what that said? There were giants in the earth in those days. That is that before or after the sons of God and the daughters of men got together? Okay, in, in those days, uh, let's see. Okay, the, the sons of God uh, saw, okay, the Lord said, okay, so it's in those days that, that the sons of God, it seems like that's in those days. Yeah, but read on then, and after. Okay, and also after that, when the sons of God came on, uh -huh. came in, okay. Uh -huh. See, that was one of my two questions that I would always ask somebody when I got in a discussion years ago. I said, uh, according to that, the giants were there before this union of the sons of God and the daughters of men. And and they change the subject. They go on, they, because, because it's, it's obvious. So regardless what you believe about giants, or if you want to call them Nephilim, go ahead, but that's not what the Bible uses. You can, I have no problem with giants. I believe the giants were there. I've never questioned the giants. What's obvious in this passage, right here in Genesis 6, the beginning of this whole scenario, what's obvious is the giants did not come from this union of the sons of God and the daughters of men. For further proof, look what it says further on there in verse 4. Um, and children were born unto them. Ch ch the, the, the children were born unto them and became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. So there's no giants even after this union of the sons of God and daughters of men. My Bible says children were born unto them. Now, some of the new versions have changed that and put giants or Nephilim or something. But, see, but that's crooked. It's crooked for a, a, someone who produces a Bible to change God's word and make it say what you want it to say. Because the Bible says children. Now, if we disagree with that and we don't believe children is right here, then we really can't have a discussion, right? We all got to use the same book or we, we can't have a debate, right? And I know you guys are King James. I'm not, I don't mean you guys. I mean the people out there. How can you have a debate with somebody when they're always saying, well, that's not in the original what it really says. Oh, so you're God. You know what the original said. And, and you know better than the translators in 1611 who gave us this book. And uh, by the way, with a hundred percent uh, vote, one man of the 46 translators, there were 46 in 19, uh, 1647, 1607, I'm sorry. When the translating work began, it started with 54 men and it was down to 46 by the time it began in 1607. All 46 men had veto power over every word in this book. Now, that's not true of the NIV and the ESV and the New King James and the NASV and, or, and all the dozens of other versions out there. They all had 51% majority rule. That's called the democracy, and democracy kills you. Because 51% can steal your property, right? We, we, you're a libertarian, uh, at least you lean that way. And you understand what I'm talking about. 51% of your neighbors can tell you what color paint to put on your house or whether you can have a garden in your front yard or not. That's, that's democracy. And we don't want democracy. We want, we want a constitutional republic. And, but I'm afraid we've, we've lost that. I don't know if we're going to get it back or not. There's still hope. But but I stopped you there. I, ho I hope I didn't offend you. But what well, the no. question here or observation? So in those days, those were giants. That is a reference point. That would be like because what what you're saying is well back. It'd be a reference point where people would say, well yeah, back during the war, before the war. Yeah. And then so you use that as a reference point, to, so they would know, you know, who who we're speaking about or when that was. So back before the war, there was the sons of men or sons of God uh, picked the daughters of men. So that, that sure. giant with the comma and the way it is, doesn't mean the giants were the sons of God. Right. right. But, but yeah. it's more than that. What it means is, see, they're telling us that Nephilim came as a result of fallen angels intermarrying with human women. The children that were born of them are Nephilim. That's what they, that's what they believe. At least 99% of the people. Uh, I realize there's a few different variations of this, but what they're saying is these fallen angels came down, saw the daughters of men, lusted after them. Now, that's not in the Bible. They've, they've, they've grabbed that somewhere. Lusted after human women, married them, 
and had children. And those children are the giants or the net because they believe the giants are the Nephilim. The giants is the word the translators used. They claim that in the original Hebrew, it's the word Nephilim and it means fallen ones. And so the children of this union are fallen ones. They're Nephilim. They're the giants. They, they have no soul. They're corrupt. They can't be saved. They can't be redeemed. And brother, talk about Calvinism. Talk about the evil of Calvinism. This half-human person was born, no, no, no choice of his own. He's born half angel, half man, and he's going to hell for eternity. Now, I got a problem with that. That's not the God that I serve. Um, you know, of no fault of his own, he's born, and he's a, he's a Nephilim. And he's, he's half-human, but he has no soul. He can't be redeemed. That's what, that's what many of them believe, not all of them. But uh, what I'm finding is a lot of people believe the Genesis 6 account, but when you tell them all this other stuff, they back up. Whoa, wait, I don't believe that. See, they've never really followed this through to where it leads. And I say in the book, a wrong understanding of Genesis 6 leads to a lot of problems later on in the Bible, and we're seeing that now. With all the way to where this thing ends. See, it begins with the gap theory, which I don't believe in, and it ends with UFOs and fallen angels flying them. And, and I want to ask you the question that, that I'm asking people. I don't know if it's in the book or not. I want to know, is there a steering wheel in that UFO or a joystick? Does, it, does any of you guys know? Uh, I haven't seen one up close uh, or far, far away. So uh. <laughs> I think See, they right, use a mouse. Right now, right now uh, a funny look ought to be on your face because a light bulb comes out. Wait a minute. Why do they need a steering wheel? These are your angels. Well, good question. Why do they need a Why do they need a spaceship? Uh, well, uh, uh, the short answer: They don't. They're not. Uh, they're not flying around in spaceships. They're not flying around in UFOs. They're spirit beings. They're ministering spirits. The Bible says. I have a whole chapter on on angels. I have a chapter on the angels in the book of Jude as well. Uh, angels are spirit beings. How do we know? Ephesians chapter 6. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now that says what it says. You, you can't get around. Remember that hammer and nail? Bang that nail in the coffin of the Nephilim because they have no flesh. They have no blood. How are they going to cohabit with a human woman? Tell, somebody out there tell me how that happens. It, it doesn't happen. It's impossible. It's physically impossible, spiritually impossible, biblically impossible. By the way, my second question that I would ask these guys years ago, before I even got to where I'm, where I'm at now in my study of this, my second question, I'm surprised you haven't asked that yet. First question I would ask them is the Genesis 6 thing. You know, there were, says, says there were giants already there. So it didn't, didn't say the giants came from the sons of God and the daughters of man. By the way, that's important. My goodness, that's the context. That's important. How do we? How come everybody's walking over that and, and not paying attention to it? That's why I made you stop at that spot. You got to stop right there. Wait a minute. What did that just say? There were giants in the land in those days. What days? Well, read the rest of the verse. And then after. Well, I made a big deal. That was after. After. Yeah, after you're, you're not. You're not saying that there wasn't giants because the Bible oh, of says there I've were never, giants. I've never said there was no right. giants. And then, there were uh, giants. The Bible says there were giants. Yeah, and I mean, you know, case, in case somebody thinks that's what you're saying, you're, you're not what saying I'm that. Point, yeah. What I want people to see is the giants did not come from the union between the sons of God and the daughters of men in Genesis 6. That is plain. Do you guys see that? Yes. I yes, mean, sir, yeah, you that don't makes have sense, to be an right? English major to get that. Well, two questions now. Why... Um, why do other versions use Nephilim, and why did King James? Because they're going to they're going to Hebrew manuscripts. They're going to they're mostly they're going to the Westcott and Hort manuscripts. Okay. I'm talking about the Alexandrian. Dan Daniels has probably talked to you about yeah a the Alexander about screen. Yeah, yeah. They're going to the other manuscripts. If you look in the King James Bible, look at that word children. You see anything funny about it? You still got that open, my brother? Uh, Genesis six four. See yeah. the word children there. What do you see there? They bear children to them. Does that word look different? Uh, in, no, no, it says children. Yeah, but wait a minute. Look at it close now. Maybe have Brother Steve look. Is there something different about that word? Let's see where we're okay. at. Okay. It's yeah, different in my we're Bible. Use, we're using the King James. I know, but, the, but look at the text. Look at the font. 
Oh, yeah, okay. It, it, I'm it not looks, trying to trick you. It looks italic. And, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I had to get your glasses out. Uh huh. Good. It's in italics. You know what that means? That means it was not in the original Hebrew manuscripts the translators had on those tables in 1607. I can show you that all through the Bible. Um, I can show you that in 2 Samuel where it says the, the wrong man killed Goliath. Uh, because the brother of, not the prophecy brothers now, the brother of, I'm sorry to keep making fun. I, I like that. <laughs> no, that's, that's prophecy good, brothers, I hear. That's good impersonation. I love it. I, I love but, you. I love uh, okay. you. Uh, evangelist, evangelist uh, Dan. Okay, so so basically, uh, I use a, a Bible program like eSword and a, a couple other ones when I want to look up stuff like this. So uh, when you're seeing something that's in italic, in, in the King James, you know, just you've got a regular Bible, you could, you know, look at the Bible program and then you'll, you'll have like the Strong's, you know, concordance yep. words. And then you could see where you'll, you'll have like, you know, maybe one Strong's number and then they'll have like a group of words because right. they're they're taking that so if somebody wants to verify what you're saying you're just not making up stuff here just <laughs> now i haven't looked it up for myself but i have a feeling in the strongs when you go to that word and you look it up in the old testament in the hebrew there uh, which i don't recommend anybody do but that's for another day i think if you go there you'll find several definitions one of them is going to be nephilim and so the new bibles grabbed that and they changed it from children to nephilim or giants, whichever it says, I don't remember. Uh, but neither one's right. The Bible put children, either the King James is right, or we shouldn't trust anything in the King James. Either every word in this Bible is there and it's right, and we shouldn't be going back to Hebrew to try to redo it. Because when you go to, to Strong's Concordance and you look up those words, what you're doing is retranslating what they did 400 years ago. And I, I, you're a mechanical engineer, but I bet you wouldn't hold the candle to those guys 400 years ago and their knowledge of languages. There's some of those guys knew 17 languages. And if they spoke in any one of those languages, you would have sworn it was his native tongue. That's how good these guys were. These guys could stand up in an audience in a church and a guy could preach in English. And one of these guys could translate from English to Greek, right? Just like that just like they do today with Spanish. Now, nobody today, nobody today can do that. Not one person upon planet Earth could stand up while I preach in English and translate it word for word on the spot, just like that, into the Greek or the Hebrew. There's nobody that good. And uh, by the way, some of the scholars have admitted that. I, I talk about it in one of my books. They've admitted that nobody can do that today. So if that's true, why don't we trust what they did and why are we going? Because we've been taught this. We've been taught to go study the Greek and Hebrew to get a deeper meaning. If there's anything in the Greek or Hebrew that's not in your English Bible, then guess what? Your Bible is not preserved properly. If you open up a can of preserves, grape, or strawberry jam, if it's not what your wife put in there a year or two ago, don't eat it. It's going to make you sick. For, to be preserved means it's exactly what was put in there back at the beginning. God so, said he'd preserve his words. That's right. So when you go to the Greek and Hebrew, and I used to do it. I took Greek in Bible college. Uh, complete waste of time. I see that now. Um, and they told us, they said, we don't study the Greek to correct the Bible. We study the Greek to shed more light upon it. That's just a, a fancy way of getting around the truth here, that they believe the Greek and Hebrew is the perfect word of God. King James is just the best we can do. And, and I used to do it for years until the year 2000, I think, so when I quit going to Greek and Hebrew, and I got an understanding of this stuff. Um, did you know, Mr. Strong, you mentioned the, the Strong's Concordance, and we don't right. want to take all, the whole show on this, but this is kind of important, though. Right. James Strong was a contemporary of, guess who? Uh, Westcott West West and North. Hort. Okay. He did not like the King James Bible. He thought there was problems with it. Hmm. Um in the book of Isaiah, just one example. In the book of Isaiah, there's a, there's a thing called a crisping pin. Do you guys remember that? Right. I think it's Isaiah 4 or somewhere in there. talks about a crisping pin. Right. That and I'll ask that, people, what is a crisping pin? It's like a purse or something. Uh, or, uh -huh. or, or it's uh -huh. a, a, a ironing for iron your hair. or 
All right, you're right. The purse or pocketbook is what the strong says. But you go ask your wife, she'll tell you what it is. She, it's a curling iron. Right, okay. An old timer curling iron back in the Old Testament. The context tells you that. So Mr. Strong got that wrong. You have to, I mean, you, you got to see that. If he got that wrong, what else is wrong in his, in his, by the way, you look at the NIV Bible, you'll find many of the definitions in the Strong's look like they're right out of the NIV. What does that tell you? That's Westcott and Hort manuscripts. That's Alexander. That's Egypt. And uh, listen, when I got a hold of this back in 2000, it was like a weight was lifted off. I can't explain it. It was like I was free all of a sudden. And I was a Bible believer, but all of a sudden, I believed this book. I didn't go to Greek anymore because I'd read my Bible. Boy, I wonder what that means in the Hebrew. Well, you know what? I'll tell you what it means in the Hebrew, what it says in English. That's what it means. But there are there is no original Hebrew or original Greek. You can't go look at it. All you can do is look at somebody's definitions. And I don't trust those guys. I don't trust James Strong. I'm not going to look at his definitions. I'm going to I'm going to look at Webster's 1828. First, I'm going to try to get the context in my King James Bible. I'm going to get the definition there if I can, which by the way, the word inspiration is only used twice. You'll see the definition. In Job 32, 8, I think it is, you'll see the only other time the word inspiration is used, and you'll find the definition right there of the word inspiration. God's spirit. He giveth the scriptures by his spirit. His spirit is on them. That's why it's alive. That's why it quickens. What does the word quicken mean? He judges the, the, the dead. It's the opposite right. of the dead. It's alive. The reason this is alive is it's got God's spirit upon it. And... Uh, and when, you, when we go to Greek and Hebrew, that's where you get Nephilim. You won't find Nephilim in the King James Bible. The word giants there, I have no problem with giants. Um, I don't want to fight any, but, uh, but I have no problem with the, the doctrine of giants. I don't claim to understand it all. I'm not sure anybody understands. Oh, God didn't tell us. Well, Nephilim, too, does it, isn't there a meaning of fallen one? Is that what the Nephilim, is that one of the meetings? Yeah, that depending, they're on, is? depending on which guy you're listening to on which okay. day on TV. I've heard him say Nephilim, the fallen ones. The fallen ones, okay. And, uh, so, but I have heard them say, I've heard, uh, I think it's uh, Mr. Lindsay, I think I heard him say it on Gary Sturman's show, that the whole world in Noah's day was corrupt, they were irredeemable, they could not be saved except those eight people, and then he changed that to seven because one of them was corrupted. You understand if one of the women on the ark was corrupted, then her... Uh, uh, or if her dad was corrupted. See, they said everybody was corrupted. That means those three girls on the boat, they had to be infected too because they were born from them daddies, weren't they? If the whole world, see, see, there's holes in everything they say. He said the whole world was corrupt with the DNA of Satan. Well, you know what that means? The, all the offspring of those men are corrupted. Well, those three daughters that married Noah's three sons, they had to be corrupted. See, see do you see the problem there? The, that's science. And uh, see, the truth is, there's nothing said about angels in Genesis chapter 6. You didn't read the word angel one time in that passage. And by the way, if you want to get the context, start in chapter 1 and chapter 2. There's the creation story, the fall of man in Genesis 3. But then you get to chapter 4 and 5, you're going to see Cain and some of that stuff. But, but, but then he goes on and talks about men began to multiply. Chapter 4 and 5, men multiplying, genealogies. And then you get to chapter 6. What's he talking about there? Well, you just read it. Plain as day, if you get the context, it came to pass when men and angels began to multiply. That's not what it says, is it? Men began to multiply. There's the context. Context, context, context. It's about men multiplying. And then chapter uh, verse two and three is going to expound upon that. The sons of God, who are the who are the saved people, the believers, the redeemed are going to get their eye on the unredeemed wild women in town, and they're going to intermarry with them. You see the same story happen in the book of Judges with, uh, with Balaam and ba Balak. What did, what did he finally do when, when he went up on the mountain? He wanted them to curse the people of God in the promised land there. Finally, he said, I'll tell you what you do. I'll tell you how you get Israel. Send your daughters down there to meet them and let them intermarry, and you'll destroy them. And God was angry at that. You see it in the book of Jude, the sin of Beor, or Peor, it said, the sin of Peor, the error of Balaam. You know what I'm talking about? What was the error of Balaam? He, he put a 
He put a stumbling block before Israel. <laughs> he told ba uh, ba Balak, he told him how to defeat Israel. They couldn't do it with swords. He said, you send your family, you make friends with them, let your daughters intermingle with them, and they'll intermarry. And boy, that brings destruction. That's the lost and the saved intermingling. That's the unequal yoke. And uh, I'm telling you, that's what Genesis 6 is about. Uh, that's not the first time that happened with Balak uh, and, and Balaam. This was, that was the, probably the second time, at least, um, this had happened before it happened in Genesis 6. Sons of God is only used 11 times in the Bible. The phrase, sons of God. I got a whole chapter just on that. Ten of those 11 times all mean exactly the same thing. Now, one guy said, oh, but Brother Goon, you're mistaken. In the New Testament, sons of God is, is redeemed people, Christians, born-again people. In the Old Testament, sons of God is angels. Uh, well, well I, would, uh, I would ask you to prove that. And I say this, um, a door <laughs> is a door is a door. What do I mean by that? When you find a door in the Old Testament, it's a door. In Revelation 4, 1, a door was open in heaven. That's a, What is that? It's a door. A door in the Old Testament is a door in the New Testament. A man in the Old Testament is a man in the New Testament. Uh, a, a raven in the Old Testament is a raven. In the, it's all English, after all, from Genesis 1 to Revelation, is, is translated into English by, by the, the translators under the guidance of, I believe, God Almighty gave us a perfect, inspired, preserved book. A door is a door is a door. And see, but this is what they do. They, they twist things. They, they, they believe something so strongly that you, you can't convince them. Oh, that's the Old Testament. Oh, sons of God are angels. Well, prove that. Prove that. Prove to me the first time that it's mentioned is what you just read, Genesis 6. That's the first mention of the phrase sons of God. Now, how do we find out what it means? It's simple. Get the context. Uh, go back to verse 1. It came to pass when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth. And uh, uh, and daughters were born unto them. It's talking about men uh, uh, having uh, wives and uh, beget, begetting children. And then chapter 2 goes a little deeper and says the uh, that the sons of God, while that was happening, the sons of God saw the daughters of men. Now, who, who told us that that was angels? If you'd never heard the story of the of fallen angels, if, if nobody, if, you, if you're a brand new Christian, you start reading your Bible in Genesis one, you'd read about uh, the creation story. You'd get to chapter three, you'd see the fall of man, and you'd get to chapter you know four, you see uh, Cain and Abel and all that. Then then you'd see Seth and the generations uh, in chapter four and five there, and then, then Noah comes along, and then you'd get to chapter six. Uh, and it says, uh, men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, and then the sons of God, the daughters of men. You would have never, if somebody hadn't told you, you'd have never said, oh, those are fallen angels. Now, you got to be honest. Man. Isn't that so? How, how would you ever get fallen angels out of that? You have to be taught that by somebody. And uh, I, well, Job 1 says so. And the, no, Job 1 says no such thing. Job 1 doesn't. By the way, this was something brand new that I learned as I wrote the book. I found, as I studied the word angel, I found there was uh, the word angel was mentioned in the book of Job, in chapter 4. Uh, and I said to myself, why didn't he use the word angel in chapter 1 and chapter 2? Remember, the sons of God came and the and uh, Satan came also among them. How come he didn't call them angels? I'll tell you why. Because they're not angels. <laughs> they're redeemed people. I believe... That Job 1 and Job 2 is paradise. I believe God met with, with, I'm talking about Abraham's bosom now, where the Old Testament saints went. There's no lost people there. The saints, when they died, they went to paradise. Because they couldn't go to heaven yet because the, the blood hadn't been shed yet. So they're in paradise. Uh, Abraham's bosom, that's where the thief on the cross went when he died. And uh, Jesus said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Jesus beat him there because he was already dead when they came to break their legs. Jesus went to paradise, and uh, the thief shows up in paradise, and then Jesus is going to lead them out of there, uh, because now the blood's applied on the mercy seat up there. So I believe that God met with them in paradise from time to time. I think Job is an instance of that. It's obvious when you read the passage, because it says Satan came also among them. Uh, 
In other words, it's it's like Satan's something different. He's a different kind than the sons of God. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Satan, you know, if they're all angels and Satan's an angel, then why does it single him out? Satan came also among them. It's, it's as if he's different than they are. Well, guess what? He is different than them. He's not a son of God. Um, uh, Satan's never been called the son of God. No angel has ever been called God's son. Never will be. They're ministering spirits. A son has an inheritance. You show me anywhere in the Bible where any angel has an inheritance. They don't. Uh, you and I have an inheritance because we're adopted into the family. And we're, we're we, as many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of God. And so, so we're children of God. We have an inheritance. And uh, we're, we're his children. That's not said of angels ever. In fact, Hebrews 1.5 specifically says, Unto which of the angels said I at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Um, now, people say, well, well, that's talking about Jesus, the only begotten. Everyone's begotten. Uh, Adam begat Cain, and uh, Cain, uh, Seth begat so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, Isaac begat so-and-so. That's a Bible word for, for begetting a child. Now, Jesus is God's only begotten son, um, and, and he was born kind of unusual with the virgin birth. But uh, um, th this thing, it, angels are not sons, never will be, never never were, never will be. I have a whole chapter on that. This is irrefutable. This is irrefutable stuff that you have to go outside the Bible. You have to go to other books. You have to go to Greek mythology and all this sci-fi stuff to try to make your point that somehow – uh, there's there's little green men up there or something, and there's UFOs flying around with angels and steering wheels and all that. It, it's not biblical, and it's not possible. Uh, see, my second thing that I would tell people, besides the uh, the giants in Genesis 6, my second question that I would ask years ago, the Bible says in Genesis 1 and 2, during the creation story, what did God say? Everything bears forth or bears fruit, after his own kind. Scientists will tell you what that means. Kind is like, it's like species, but I'm not sure that's accurate, but that's good enough for, for now. But it's like different species, different, like there's the, there's the, there's the cat family, there's the dog family, there's the horse, or, the, or whatever you call the horses, but you know what I mean. Different kind of animal a, completely. Right, right. A horse cannot mate with, uh, with a giraffe. It's, it's scientifically impossible and it's biblically impossible. Um, it's a line in the sand that God put there, and man, nobody can cross that. Look, a, a birch tree can't, uh, a birch tree has baby birch trees, if you want to be funny and use that terminology. The seed within the birch tree is a birch tree, not a spruce tree. And uh, now I'm not saying you can't have mutations and some of this stuff they do, but one thing about mutations, they can't reproduce. Just like, what is it, the mule? Uh, is it the mule or the donkey that can't can't reproduce? Because it's a cross between a couple of. Oh yeah, I don't I know. Yeah, but yeah, mule. but when when man right. does something and and does some kind of crossbreeding, they can't reproduce. They're sterile. Right, and uh, but but the, but there's a there's a principle there that that uh, a man cannot reproduce with a monkey, or vice versa, or a dog and a cat, nor could a could a spiritual being like an angel reproduce with the human woman, even if he had reproductive organs, which he doesn't, even if he had a seed, which he does not, even if he had a, a, a desire, he, he could not. And I don't believe they have the desire. They definitely don't have the, uh, the mechanical uh, parts, or the body parts, if you want to be blunt here. They, uh, I, I say they're sexless. You know, everyone argues, oh, brother, God, they're, they're male in the Bible. Well, God's male too. And uh, but but that you know but God made man male and female. So he didn't make the, uh, angels male and female. The angels that, uh, that appear as as men in the Bible. Yeah, that's, that's for our benefit, I'm sure. Right. So I mean, the Bible just says they they appear as men. They you know be careful to entertain that's strangers. Yeah. So, but that's as far as it goes in the Bible. Right. Yeah. Just I, they I, appear. Appear. Yeah. Yeah. But they're not men, and the, I believe. Listen, if God created angels. And they're all masculine. Let's use the word masculine. Then they obviously don't have uh, reproductive organs. I mean, what what would be the use of that? Uh, be no no use at all. Uh, God didn't give them reproductive organs. They're no baby angels. They're no female angels. They they don't reproduce. They're they're eternal beings that were created outside of our universe. They were not created in the six days of creation. 
that's another thing that a lot of people got wrong here. Uh, the angels are not created in Genesis 1. They were created outside of time and space. That's for another day. Uh, but it is important in our discussion here to, to realize that they're from another dimension, another a spirit world. They're not flesh and blood. They have no seed. What would they need a seed for? There's no female angels. Uh, by the way, look what Satan had to do to mess with Job. He had to get permission from God. Uh, God said, hey, to consider my servant Job, none like him in all the earth. Yeah, you got to, by the way, to get the impression that they're not on earth in that discussion. Did you catch that? Have you considered my servant? Hey, where is Job? How come he's not there? Because this is paradise. Job hasn't died yet. He's down on the earth. This is paradise. Have you considered Job? Yeah, uh, uh, you got a hedge about him. You let me at him. And uh, you know the story. That's a different place. It's a di actually, it's a different dimension. They're in paradise uh, outside of our dimension. You can't understand that stuff. It's like heaven. God is not far from every one of us, Paul said. But what does that mean? It's another dimension. It's as close as, I mean, so, it's right there. You know, you're talking about e eternity is outside of time. Right. I mean, the time, you know, we, we have a lifetime here on, you know, on earth. But God inhabits eternity. Uh Okay, so in Genesis that's... 1, in the beginning, God right. created. That doesn't mean the beginning of everything. It certainly doesn't mean the beginning the, of the third heaven. The beginning of creation. Died. That's right. It's the beginning of the 7,000-year period of time and space that we live in. We just happen to be near the end of the 6,000th year. But this and, is this, yeah, Jesus, this period. Jesus is uh, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's our creator. Yeah. He, and he, he, became, uh, he became man, uh, became flesh. Uh, yep. Okay, I don't know how this all goes together other than, uh, okay, there could be, uh, you know, the angels were created, you know, outside of time. Right. And, uh, and, and but they're created as, as spirit beings, and they're not flesh and blood. So let me ask you guys a question. Can Satan create anything? Uh, uh, he can create lies. Uh, <laughs> he's a father of lies. He's a, he's a. He's a counterfeiter, isn't he? Right. But, but I mean, we're right, Moses, because what you're saying is, uh, if they're saying that the angels became flesh, then that's actually a heresy towards they, the incarnation of Jesus. That's right. And, and that's one of the things in the book. There's, there's several things that make this a big deal. And that's one of them. It lessens the virgin birth of Christ. Because what they're saying is, fallen angels were doing that for thousands of years before Jesus came along. They were doing the same thing that God did in the virgin birth uh, because they they would have had to have created life in the womb of a woman because they have no seed. They have no flesh and blood. By the way, the, the blood of the baby comes from the man, not the woman. The blood in Mary's veins never entered the veins of Jesus' body in the womb. And that's true of every one of us. Our fathers, the blood came from the seed. Just like a, a seed of a tree. Everything needed is in that seed. The woman produces the egg, the, the shell that it's going to be nourished in. And uh, you know, it's going to get nutrients and water. But the blood, the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. So how can an angel that has no blood give life to a baby in a woman's womb that needs blood to be alive? Uh, the answer is they don't. They'd have to create something. Satan could not create one single blade of grass out there in my lawn. Not one. He doesn't have the power to create anything. So you see, so you see all the all the principles of the Bible that are way back in Genesis that the, that they've they've ignored or broken after his kind. The fact that giants were here before this union took place. Giants were already here. So we can argue what the giants were. That's for another day. I don't get in that discussion because I don't care what the giants were. I want people to understand what they were not. They were not fallen angels. They were not born of angels. They were there before the union of the sons of God and the daughters of men. That's a fact. And uh, that's a biblical principle right there. You can't deny that. And uh, angels can't, uh, they can't create. They can't, uh, they have no blood. They have no flesh. Uh, they, they dead sure don't have any reproductive organ, organs. They have no seed. I know everybody goes to Genesis 3.15 and, and they butcher that verse. Uh, they say, well, the Bible says that Satan does have a seed. Genesis 3.15, the seed, the seed of Satan. Yeah, well, read the rest of the verse. It also says the woman has a seed. Brother, do, do, do... Yeah, women don't <laughs> did have you guys seed have yet. biology class? I had biology class <laughs> in high school. 
The woman doesn't have a seed. Obviously, the sto- the, that passage is figurative, isn't it? Right. Talk the seed about of the Jesus. woman was Christ, was, right. the, was the Holy Ghost. Satan doesn't have a seed. He has followers. Ye are of your father, the devil, Jesus said. Well, does that mean Satan, Rosemary's baby, was true after all? Satan slept with all these women and all these, so all these people are, uh, their father is Satan? No, you know, come on, we're not thinking properly. That's sci-fi stuff. That's that's not true. When he said, ye are of your father, the devil, what he meant is you're, 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 you're following Satan. You're, you're not a son of God. You're, you're, you're a follower of Satan. You're doing his will and his deeds, and, and you need to be born again. And uh, so he has no seed. He has no flesh. He has no blood. He can't create life. He dead sure can't have sexual intercourse with a human woman. I mean, we're talking about an invisible being here. Uh, now, here's here's what they say. And we talked about this earlier. Maybe it was before the show came on. We were talking about uh, some uh, a devil inhabiting a person. And I'm not sure that they can fully take over a person. I know people can be indwelled in and demon possess. I understand some of that, but I don't think it can be a full-blown thing. I don't think it can completely take over your body. Uh, I still think we have a choice there. But well, let's say a let's say a, a demonic being does get a hold of somebody, and he somehow is kind of controlling that person, or if you want to call it, he's indwelled, he's possessed. When that man goes home and sleeps with his wife, whose baby and, and a baby is in, is conceived, whose baby is it? Is it the devil's baby, the Satan's baby, or the angel's baby? Or is it that man's sperm? It's, just, it's an easy question. Obviously, just because you're controlled by an outside force, that's still your body, it's still your hands, that's still your, your seed within you. And when a baby's born, it's not Rosemary's baby, it's not Satan's baby, it's, it's, the, it's the father's baby who fathered it, not, not an angel. So I'm just saying that's one of the arguments they bring up, that they, they that's how they get a body, is they, they indwell somebody's body and and that that's just that's not biblical that's, that's just not biblical well, at all i never heard that one so okay so that's another one <laughs> well how does the book of enoch play on all of this the book of enoch is where the, all this stuff is coming from and the, the book of enoch is 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 mentioned and i think uh the book of jude but let's let's look at that i'm glad i'm glad but, you brought that up but Go that ahead. doesn't mean that we have that same book of you Enoch. just you just opened another door here for okay. us. And that's, <laughs> that's covered in the book too, isn't and it? And I'm gonna I'm gonna take advantage of that uh, okay. right here. Let's took let's look at you because I did this on my Facebook page one night. Uh, a lady said the same thing that you just said, and I said, Well, let's go look at that. It's only one chapter, so we ought to be able to find it here. It's uh we'll want to start in verse 13, I guess. Why don't, uh, do you want to read that? 13 and 14? 13, 14. It says, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with, with ten thousand, ten thousands of his saints. Okay, so it doesn't say the book of Enoch. It says now, Enoch. Let me read that again the way these guys think it when they when they talk about it. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, wrote of these saying, see, that's how people are saying it. It never says that he wrote a book. And I can see that a light's come on in your head, my brother, because, right. because you thought just like most of us have thought over the years, so it says he wrote a book, it says no such thing. Okay, I but, think that what the, the Bible had, talks about the book of, uh, I forget what, Jasher, what is, Jasher, book of Jasher. The book of Jasher. Okay, so... But that, I mean, that, that's maybe that's where people are getting confused. That's probably where I got confused. Right. But the book of Jasher, I, I'm not sure anybody's ever seen that book. I mean, uh, yeah, there's, there's copies of, uh, I haven't read it, but I mean, you know, they, they say it's a book of Jasher, but that doesn't mean it is. But Right. Yeah. But, but here's the thing. J- Jude tells us that Enoch, the seventh in generation from Adam, prophesied something. He said, he, he cometh with 10,000th of his saints. That's not the rapture. That's the second coming. Nobody back there saw the rapture. It was a mystery revealed to the Apostle Paul after Acts chapter 9. So what did Enoch see and prophesy about? He he, the second coming and the setting up of the kingdom. And that's pretty exciting. But it doesn't say that he wrote a book. Now, did he write a book? He might have. I don't know. Did he write the book of Enoch? 
that's in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Definitely not, because it's filled with all kinds of error and mistakes and, and problems. But what's happening now, and this was just on Gary Stearman's program just a few weeks ago with L.A. Mazzulli, and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the enemy of either one of those men. Gary seems like a fine gentleman. L.A. seems like a fine gentleman. I, I actually have a discourse between him and I in the book. It was done on my YouTube channel, and uh, he... He was trying to refute something I said, and I wrote about three pages, and he never responded after that. But, uh, you know, the same stuff I'm talking about right now, I, I blew out there at him. He brought up the seed of Satan and all this stuff. And Brother Goodwin just doesn't understand the Satan's seed and the battle that's going on. You know, Gary Stearman actually said on that program, I couldn't believe it. I almost fell off my chair. He said that God created man to be used as a pawn in the battle between God and Satan. You ever heard that before? I saw that episode, but I, I think where's that's that the in the first Bible? I, heard I want to ask Gary, where's that in the Bible? That's nothing but conjecture and human reasoning. And and the, my goodness, that's not. But talk if about I remember that episode, great. too. It, it almost sounded like because you had sent that to me. We watched it that, uh, one night. Right. But, uh, it, it, it sounded like that Gary said that basically God was trying using man to entrap yeah, to entrap yeah. Satan. Entrap Satan, but God's not a God of entrapment, is he? No. I mean, think about legally, like, police can't use evidence when they entrap somebody. But look at it this yeah. way. Look, what does that say about his his care about us? We were just a pawn in a, in a battle. That's not what the Bible says. Psalm 8, boy, Psalm 8, what is man that thou art mindful of him? God loves me, for God so loved the world. He's not talking about the cliffs and rocks. He's talking about mankind. God loves us. He didn't create us to, uh, the truth is, man got caught up in Satan's battle. It's not, he's got it backwards. You see, God created hell for Satan and the angels. The Bible says so. In case they ever sinned, and they did, Man got caught up in that same sin because they man fell for the, the, the carrot that Satan offered Eve that day. And uh, uh, by the way, had Eve died and Adam lived, you and I wouldn't be sinners today. The bloodline is passed through the man because the blood comes from the man, not the woman. Now, she's still a sinner, don't get me wrong, but the bloodline, the sin, the sin, the blood, the tainted blood comes through the man. And so every child born of a woman has the blood of his father and it's tainted sinful blood. And, uh, and that's why there is no way that Satan fathered any children. He has no blood. He can't create life. He can't do anything. He's a counterfeiter. And that's why it's the great distraction. What, what, what's, every, what's every TV program on Prosty Station? What are they all talking about? What's all the books? The new book is just out, The Return of the Nephilim. The Return of the Nephilim, yeah. Now, what's happened to us? What happened to old-fashioned Bible prophecy? What happened to preaching on the rapture and the and the seven feast and the and the jubilee and all these uh, and the and the signs of the time? Now it's all about uh, you, know, you know ten feet tall nephilims and UFOs and fallen angels and and I wonder what's coming next with these guys. Well, we just had it because on that same show, Ellie uh, Ellie Mazzuli told the story about late at night, God spoke to him. The Holy Spirit spoke to him. He didn't say it was audible, but God. The Holy Spirit told him the answers are in the book. I mean, I got one here somewhere. I got a book of Enoch. The answers are in the book of Enoch. And I couldn't believe it. And Gary Stearman st sitting over there. And again, they're not my enemies. I'm just, I want people to know what they're saying. I want them to get right. Because this is, this is heresy. Gary Stearman holds up his book of Enoch. He's nodding his head. And, and he says, well, Gary, you understand. Because I called you that night. We talked for an hour. And Gary kind of gave him the right hand of fellowship on this. Gary enabled this false teaching. And on his show before thousands of people, old ladies and old men, people who watched their show, he just elevated the book of Enoch to the status of Scripture. That's exactly what they did. He said that God told me the answers are in this book, this book of Enoch. And I say that's a lie. That's a lie, and I and I I, re, I rebuke Gary Stearman, and I think I did so on my TV show. I like I want Gary Stearman to get right on that. He needs to come out publicly and say I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. That's just a book. It's not it's not scripture. Um, you know we don't know what what you know maybe L. A. Missouli thinks that he heard from God, but uh, the Bible says try them spirits. And I I'd say to L. A. Missouli, uh, 
you better try that spirit, buddy, because that's not that's not of God. The Canaan of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation is the Word of God, nothing else. We cannot go outside that book to get our doctrine. And what did they just do? They just elevated the Book of Enoch. Now everybody's gonna gonna be looking to the Book of Enoch. Boy, there's a lot of junk in the Book of Enoch. Um, so this is serious stuff. It's going to affect people. And uh, so I wrote the book, The Great End Time Distraction. We got to get the truth about this. And we got to quit listening to these guys who are who are preaching stuff that's outside the box. My goodness, Steve Quayle said that uh, Merlin the Magician was a fallen angel. Did you guys hear that one? He was a uh, Nephilim. Did you know did that? I, did I, you hear that? I, did, I didn't hear that. I, I thought Merlin the Magician was a was a fictitious, fictitious character in a fairy tale. I guess I was wrong. Uh, I, I saw probably some kind of discovery show or uh, something about, uh, you know, the origins of that that may have been just, you know, some uh, uh, witch doctor that, you know, name Merlin, but I mean, who knows? <laughs> witch doctor? Well, that, that one. Okay. Yeah. That, but, but Steve Quayle said, he looked right at Gary Stearman, you know that, uh, that uh, you know that Merlin was a was a, a Nephilim, right? And of course, Gary just kind of nodded his head. I don't know if he believed it or not, but I am like, come on, man, this, this is crazy. Thor? Thor's a Thor's a fallen angel or an Ephraim or something. Hercules? No, that's Greek mythology. By the way, what's the root word of mythology? Myth. It's fake. The Bible talks about fables. We better be careful about fables. And, and that's what this stuff is. It's fables. And, and it's gotten way out of hand. Way out of hand. I believe if people will read the book with an open mind, I believe I'll prove to them beyond any shadow of a doubt that no angel ever had children with a human woman. Never, ever, and never will. And uh, I, I believe this is all a big a big misunderstanding, big lie. Uh, I'm not saying they're lying. I, th I think these guys really believe this stuff. But What's they've gone opinion? outside the Bible. Yeah, so they, yeah, because they, they're getting it from the Book of Enoch. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, all these people that say they've been abducted? I don't believe it. You don't believe it? I don't believe a bit of it. Uh, I mean, what, I'm a, there's, look at the, there's all kinds of beliefs out there. Um, you know, when I was a teenager, and I'll bet you'd say the same thing. I remember in high school, we had all kinds of superstitions. We would, we, I grew up in Maine. We'd drive these long roads on the school bus at night going to basketball games. And they, we'd be telling ghost stories. And there was the story about this graveyard that had a, a foot on the gravestone and we drop. Yeah, there it is. It's still in. You know, we had all kinds of, you know, you, 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 you can see about anything. If you're not careful, your eyes will trick you. I have people that call me all the time. You, you don't understand brother. Good. I saw you. I'm telling you, you don't realize I saw it. I saw a bone eye. Well, you saw something. I don't know what you saw, but I, I know, I know you didn't see something from Mars and I know you didn't see an, an angel flying around in a spaceship. Um, but it's an unidentified what. flying object, you know. Yeah, yeah well, that, doesn't I mean a, a, that doesn't mean a flying saucer, right? Just unidentified. Yep. Um, okay. And I have a chapter on that UFOs, true or false. I believe in UFOs, but but they're not what people think they are. Most of this stuff, the real stuff that people are seeing, and a lot of it's fake, a lot of it's just lights, lasers, I mean, just reflections. I mean, you see anything. But the ones that are really something, it's military stuff. I almost, I could just about guarantee you 99% of that. It's something that our military's got up there. What do you and think is going on with Tucker Carlson and, and uh, all that uh, all that footage that he's been showing lately? And, yep. all these and, and one thing about on. UFO footage, if you noticed, you can, you, can, you can take a satellite and see somebody's number plate from, from, Earth, from, from, the, from up there down on Earth. But all, every UFO film you ever see, it's all cloudy and fuzzy. And why is that? Isn't that strange? And why is our government suddenly releasing this now? What, what's this all about? Look, anyone that trusts our the federal government hasn't been paying attention the last four years. Hasn't been paying attention. They they have been lying to us for decades. They That's saw, yeah. They they've in, uh, concealed and, and hidden and killed off people that had anything to do with JFK, yeah. but they're releasing UFO stuff now. Yeah, and even Trump was going to release all the JFK stuff. And they talked him out of this one little thing here, and we're never going to know. So they even talked him out. Oh, we can't release that as the secret stuff. That, what do you mean, 40, 50 years ago? What secret? What are you talking about? Release that. 
Yeah, it's it's, it's too incriminating for mm -hmm. for the fraud. That's well, going on. Yeah, yeah, more than 40, 60 years now, and they were. It's going to be sixty years, and they were supposed yeah. to release it at fifty. So, so what, what what's in that that they don't want us to see? I mean, well, the, the, how about the, people, the truth? Yeah, the yeah. people that are controllers. Or the people I want to cover stuff up. So. In the book, I have the a chap. I have in the UFO chapter the stuff about the Manhattan Project. Everybody needs to read that. 1945. Of course, FDR dies. Johnson is sworn in. Not no Truman. Truman is sworn in, and they had to tell him about the atomic bomb that they had built. He didn't know about. It. He's the vice president. Didn't even know about it. It was secret. There was like a hundred thousand people working in there. Only a few people at the top knew what they were doing. Top secret. Now, there was a Russian spy in there, too, collusion, Russian collusion, way back then. And uh, they tested that thing out in the desert. This is all in the book. They tested it. They didn't know what was going to happen. They raised that thing up on a crane and, and, and ignited that thing. It crystallized the ground. Mushroom cloud, like 40,000 feet in the air. It broke windows 100 miles away. And you know what our government did? They told the American people that a munitions dump exploded. 1945, they lied to us. They've been lying to us ever since. They, they lied. You can't believe the government. So, so they've released some UFO stuff. Oh, yeah, that's real comforting. I, I, I really believe it. I didn't even watch it. I have no idea. What, did you see it? Oh, I saw some of the clips on YouTube. It's, yeah. It looks but, like a, a triangle shape. But yeah, it's uh, blurry. You know, it you know, could have been. Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe we do have uh, you know, anti aircraft. Uh, I mean, anti aircraft. Anti aircraft. Blurry. Did you catch that? It was blurry. Yeah, but it's always blurry. Right. Yeah, cell stuff. phones. Cell phones can do better than the footage yeah. that they were showing on there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, they they didn't show anything that was going to do anything. It just keeps the question out there. Keeps us, you know, preparing us for you know they're, they're going to use that for something in the future. Um, they're going to blame something on them people from out up from Mars somewhere. Something's going to happen. They're going to blame it on that. They're preparing us for that right now. But, quick, quick question. You brought up the other day uh, on your show that uh, the Catholics are having some conferences and they're using Steve Quayle's book. Steve Quayle's book. Okay. Yeah. And uh, now I guarantee you they wouldn't use my books, any of my books. So, but but also the the Pope and the Vatican they've been kind of laying the, they, they've been uh, laying the groundwork for aliens. So what? What do you see here as far because as... Because it's uh, a distraction from distraction. the truth. That's yeah. what that's about. Yeah. Um, you know, you can't trust those people either. No, you can't trust them, but I mean, what do you what do you think? Uh, well, what's, I think their, we, what's their goal with this? Well, you know, they have this, fa this famous telescope that everybody talks about. They're looking out into the... They're looking for something out there. And I uh, guarantee it's not God they're looking for. Um, now, a lot of them are deceived, but I think there's... I think if we... If, and nobody's, I don't know, I don't know if anyone's done this study yet. I haven't. I want to see where the origins of this stuff really is. I think you'll find the Vatican has its hands in there. Because this, anything that distracts people from the truth helps them. Well, right, because the, the Vatican, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, they they never stopped their counter-reformation, uh, you know, movement. You know, the, you know, the Jesuits are the kind of reformation group uh, you know got the jesuit pope in there so i mean uh they keep on promoting this stuff but it looks like they're they're trying to uh you know get get the uh, the protestant uh world so uh you know goofy looking yeah <laughs> or you know make them look like they're you know uh, you know discredit it so they so they can you know get rid of us and say well look we need to lock up these these weirdos or it seems like that's what's going on in, in yeah. general I mean, with everything. And they want that one world religion, except for they don't want uh, the fundamentalists. In well, we're we're going to be the armband guys like the Jews were. Right. We're going to be, and this whole COVID thing is all involved in this. That's I, that was going to be one of my questions: is how do you? And you see may have to bleep. You'll up. have to bleep. You'll have to bleep that word out. If oh you're yeah. Put this on YouTube. Yeah. Be, yeah oh, right. Well, did did you happen to see? Uh, uh, but I sent uh, I sent an email to you the other day. But uh, you know they had that last year that House Resolution sixty six sixty six about you know tra contact tracing, and then this right now the they're they're trying to pass uh, House Resolution six 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 that you know, is basically like a continuation of that. But you know they 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 have to pick those numbers. You know and that 
you know, basically, you know, it's, it's, it goes along with, you know, you can't buy or sell without, you know, having, uh, you know, so we have to watch what kind of words we use, but you know, without taking their mark. <laughs> yep. so, yeah. So that I mean, that could be a distraction too that they purposely pick those numbers because you just kind of wonder when they, they do something. They cause they want you looking over here. They get a reaction, then they're doing something over here. So or get us to, get us to overreact. No. Well, okay. This uh, I guess uh, I use the, the concordance to look up where word, words are. You know, we're talking about you know the Strong's, but the, you know the, the Greek and Hebrew, uh, you know numbers and all that. Uh, you know, we're talking about you know that that uh, Strong's was uh, yeah the, the the dictionary in the back, and this is just you you got to do what you believe. I'm I'm just telling you what I believe. I believe it's dangerous to look up them definitions back there because uh, you you're getting NIV definitions is what you get. Right, because he was in with Westcott and Horton. Yeah. And, you know the uh, you know basically the. Now, let Bible. me tell you a brief story, if you got a minute. Yeah. yeah. I talked to the greatest Hebrew scholar probably in the world. I don't remember, I don't remember his name. I've got I still got the email. He he lives in Israel, he's a Jew, he's unsaved. He's a Hebrew scholar. He's been to Bob Jones University, he's looked at all their stuff. I got a hold of him and I asked him, you know that passage in 2 Samuel 19 about uh so and so killed Goliath? It's a it's a it's a mistake. Um, and I, I contact him. Now, my it's not a mistake in your Bible. It says the brother of all the new Bibles. In fact, maybe all of them, including the New King James, took the, took the italic words, the brother of, out of there because they're not in the Hebrew. And so it says that El, Elkahine, whatever his name is, killed, killed Goliath. Well, we know that's not true. David killed Goliath. So this guy killed the brother of Goliath. He had four brothers. Killed his brother. Uh, and the King James, it's right, but it's the brother of is in italics. The italics are there from the translators because they were honest scribes, and they knew they wanted the reader to know these words we put there because they belong there, but they were not in any of the ancient manuscripts that we had in this room. They had everything. They had all the Greek manuscripts, Hebrew they had the Bishop's Bible, the Tyndale Bible, the cover. They had it all. And they had the, they, they used them all. to to. They didn't have a, a blank page. They had the Bible. They just bettered it. And, and I believe they it was the final purification of the Word of God. And by the way, it's the first time in 5,800 years of human history that you could carry the Word of God under your arm in one volume of a book. That was never true until 1611. And uh, I have some of that in, in some of my books. But uh, here's what I learned. Here's what I got, what I wanted to know from this guy. I contacted him. I wanted to know if it was true that the Hebrew didn't have the brother of him. That's what I wanted to know. He probably thought that I was questioning the veracity of the King James Bible because he didn't know what I was asking him. I asked him in the Hebrew manuscripts that you have looked at, you're a scholar, you're one of the great Hebrew scholars of the world. Is that actually in the Hebrew? But but and he said, nope, it's a and he actually said this exact thing. He said it's a conundrum. <laughs> it's a conundrum. He says, uh, uh, it's not there, it's a mistake, but we know that it belongs there because we got the rest of the Hebrew Bible, and we know other places say that David. So that answered that is what I wanted to hear. Now, he doesn't know why I asked the question. What my point was, there is no perfect Hebrew anywhere on planet Earth nor is there any perfect Greek on planet Earth. Why are we going to something that's imperfect to correct something in the English language that we speak that is perfect? Because we've been taught this by professors and Bible college uh, presidents, and, and uh, uh, we've been brainwashed into thinking that there's something in the Greek and Hebrew that we don't have in our English Bible. And if there is, then we've got to go sell cars and throw our Bibles away because there's no hope for any of us. Because God promised to preserve his word. If this isn't it, if it's not perfect, word for word, if there's something in the Greek that didn't come through in the translation, because here's what they say. Well, there's no word in the English language. Oh, oh really? The brother of? There's no word in the English language for brother? Are you kidding me? It's all through the Hebrew Bible. There's a word for brother in Hebrew and English. They're lying to us. Well, there was no word to adequately trans translate from uh, Hebrew to English. Yes, there was. God was in charge of it. He did it. Either we believe that or we or we should go sell cars. 
either I've got the perfect word of God and I shouldn't question any word in there, or I should go be a car salesman and be honest. Right. Like, yeah, like, well, we already said that God said he'd preserve his word. So, I mean, he, you believe yeah. that or you don't believe that. Um, but see, but, when you but see time, like that, when I mean, you, you see you can, a, word, understand what that means. Yes, it's inspired. It's supposed right. to be there. Don't ever question an italicized word, but realize why it's there. Now, the the Greek theologians will tell you that's there because there there were no no you know there were no pro they, they shouldn't be there. They're just there to help clarify. No, they're there because they belong there, and that's what the Hebrew guy said. Yes, that belongs there, but it's not in the original, not in any Greek manuscripts on the planet. He said, so that's a mistake. That's a, a mistake in the Hebrew Bible. Why are we going back thinking the Hebrew is the, is the perfect word of God? It's not. God didn't choose Hebrew to, to reach the world. He chose English. You understand there's two great awakenings that happened in the 1700s and the 1800s that shook the entire planet. What Bible did they use? They weren't using Hebrew. They weren't looking up Greek words. They were running around with the King James Bible. For 300 years, that's all anybody in English trusted was the King James. All of a sudden, in our generation, this is no good anymore. So who, who's the author of that? Satan's the author of that. Way back to Genesis 3. It all ends where it began, by the way. It all ends where it began in the garden with the, with the serpent, with the bride, and some liberating fruit. The serpent is Satan. The bride is the church. The liberating fruit is Greek, Hebrew, the NIV, the New American Standard, all this other stuff. See, that's where we're at today. And uh, okay, you mentioned uh, Webster, Webster's Dictionary from uh, the 1800s. 1828. You can get it free. You can watch. You can get it online free. I, I got. Uh, I have it on my phone. Okay, so so basically, uh, I mean that that's so uh, you know they keep on trying to you know, change the language all the time. You know, change the meaning of words. But yep. you know, we go back to Webster's Dictionary from back then. That so we we know what our good translation, the you know, King James. Yeah, my rules are this. First, try to find the definition within the context of the word. Second, go use the law first mention. Look, look, the first time the word is used in the Bible is usually going to define it for you. It'll mean the same thing throughout the Bible. A door is a door is a door. I would say that in a Bible college. If I was teaching a class at Bible college, I'd say the exact same thing. A door is a door is a door. And, uh, uh, and then I would also look up, try looking up every word in the Bible. I've got a good study for you. Go study the word gospel. The word gospel, boy, have we been hoodwinked. I mean, even my, my brethren, my fellow Baptist preachers, they think the gospel is the death, bell, and resurrection. That's probably what you guys have been taught. The gospel, first benefits, the death, bell, and resurrection. Well, I'll tell you what. Look up every place the word gospel is used and try to, try to put death, bell, and resurrection and replace it with that. You'll be scratching your head to your ball that doesn't fit. I'll tell you what gospel means. God, it's made of two words, gos and spell. God and spell. It's God's spelling, God's word. The gospel is God's word. The gospel truth, what's truth? Sanctify them by thy, by, by thy word. Thy word is truth. And so gospel is truth. It's, it's God's word. And uh, now, is the death, bell, and resurrection part of the gospel? Sure, it is. It's God's word. And uh, but it, see, we you got guys that say, well, when you lead someone to the Lord, you got to you got to make sure they understand the death, bell, and resurrection. That's fine. It's, yeah, you don't have to make that big a deal of it. But uh, see, they they think that's what the gospel is: death, bell, and resurrection. Now, that's that's part of the word of God, but it's not what the gospel means. So um, anyway, repentance. I mean, people have gone nuts on repentance. They've, it's become something you got to turn from all your sins. Well, good luck. Ain't nobody going to heaven. We don't know all our sins. And there's we're all saved here. We, we, we all got sins in our life. We got stuff we don't even know is wrong in our life. But we're still growing. How do you repent of all your sins? Jesus paid for all of them. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I trusted him in my sin. I came to him just as I am. I didn't, clean with, I didn't turn from my sins and then turn to him. That's impossible. I came to him without any hope. I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell. I'm guilty. And I called out for his mercy. And he reached out and took me as I was, a sinner. And uh, that's, that's Passover. Remember the Passover story? 
Remember, they had to get rid of all their sins before they put on the blood, right? No. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. But there's so much false teaching today. False teaching on the gospel, false teaching about the Bible. Uh, see, Gary Stearman, I'm sure you heard me talk about the word heaven. The seventh word of your King James Bible. Can you, uh, can you quote that, my brother? Genesis 1-1, the beginning of it. Can you quote that? Okay, I'm, I'm bad with that. In the beginning, God created oh, the heaven. Let's well, say the heaven. word is heaven. Wait, now. wait a minute, say it again. In the beginning, God created the heaven and, and the earth. All right, he got it right. He got it right. I was, okay, trying, but, I was trying to trip you up. Here. Okay, they say they are the heavens and the earth. Right, and they're wrong. It's heaven. And I even proved that in Hebrew, not that I ever use Hebrew, but I looked it up and I, I found that it can be singular or plural. It's context that tells you which. And uh, But I actually... I actually it's found sort of like you is, is singular or you can be plural. Well, in modern English, yeah, I think yeah. it was you, you it could be single. Or, well, well, what but I'm saying is, old that, English was, yeah, a word can be singular or plural. You know, the, Look at now, Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made heaven singular and earth. I wonder if they say that's wrong too. Mm -hmm. So, but that was Gary Stearman with Steve Quayle. And he said that the, the King James Bible translators got that wrong. And I made a big deal of that. That's the seventh word of our Bible, the word heaven. And they said that it was wrong. If I can't trust the seventh word, why would I trust the seventh book or the seventh verse? Uh, why would I trust anything if the seventh word's wrong? <laughs> That's and, a pretty and, and we're not, you know, I mean, Gary Stearman, I've watched him before. And I mean, he seems like a genuine nice guy. So uh, yeah. not, we're not, I, mean, I, I believe they're genuine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're not. You know, we're, and nobody, and, and like I say, this is the uh, part of the, uh, this is the sec part two. So um, I wanted to do this to really to get both sides. Didn't want to debate really, because um, we didn't want any, you know, sometimes those can get a little heated and we didn't want anybody at odds with each other. Well, it's any, almost any impossible. So we, I thought we'd have a part one and part two. It's almost impossible to debate one of these guys because i'm going to use the king james bible they're going to use the book of enoch and greek mythology and talk about thor and, and uh and you you know what somebody saw with about a ufo well i got this guy i've got very you know he saw this well i don't you know how do i debate that <laughs> so, now, i'll talk to anybody on this issue with the bible plus the study show ourselves approved unto god so yep. that's what we're trying to do here well can you pray us out brother dan Yes, sir. Father in heaven, thank you for these gentlemen. These, these are good men. I, I love them. I love their show. And Lord, I pray you'll bless their lives and their families. And, uh, make them lights in the community. May they have an influence in their area. May they, may they be pillars of the church that they attend. And Lord, may they be strong Bible believers and promoters of the truth. And we thank you for all you're going to do, Lord. We thank you for this discussion we've had tonight. And Lord, this is a uh, this is an important discussion. This is a huge distraction upon the world. And we've got to get this right. God's people, God's preachers have got to get this right. And Lord, I pray you use the book. I pray you use me and these gentlemen to help get truth out there. And Lord, everybody's going to have to decide for themselves what they believe. But I hope and pray that we've given them something to chew on tonight. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for salvation, for the blood that was shed for us. And we look forward to that day when the trump of God shall sound and we'll be taken out of here. And until that day, may we serve you with all we've got. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus amen. Name. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Dan. Thanks, Thank everybody, for watching. Uh, check out the links. Uh, I'm going to have them on the website and in the show notes. You can go there and, and get the Oh, he's going to blow the show fire. He's got the show fire, yeah. All right. Well, there we go. All right. All right. See you next time. Thank you very much. Brothers. Subscribe to our YouTube channel.